go in the same package we're told by some. Well, of course, if you want to study God, there's a great place to do that. It's right here. Because this is his autobiography. It's what he said is true of himself. It's what he wants to be true of you and me. And so he gave us a book by which to learn him, to know him. And we have how many books by which we can learn him and know him? 66. Now, I know the 27 books of the New Testament are the books under which we live as our covenant today. But it was a New Testament Christian named Paul who said that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what? Even a New Testament Christian named Paul said there's something valuable in the Old Testament. It helps us to learn a number of principles. And I want to just see how God revealed himself in some of these examples. They'll be very familiar to you. But I don't think we can go over them enough because of a couple of reasons. One, Peter said when he wrote his epistle in 2 Peter 1, he said, though you know these things, I'm going to remind you as long as I'm in this tabernacle so that you'll be established in the present truth. He wanted them to always be grounded in the truth. We cannot afford to assume that the members of the church just know certain things that we've always heard. We have to keep on teaching those things and making sure that we're emphasizing those young people coming up may never have heard those things. Visitors to our services might never have heard those things. And it doesn't do any of us any harm, and it does quite a bit of good for us to learn these things over again. So let me ask, can grace and precision obedience exist and coexist in the same uh, biblical universe? Let's go to Genesis and notice, if you will, please, in chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, of course, is uh, Noah and the ark and the building of that ark in preparation for the coming flood. If you'll notice verse 8 of Genesis 6, but Noah found what? Grace in the eyes of the Lord. What is grace? It is an unmerited favor. It is that which God bestows upon us, which we do not deserve and which we could never earn. And Moses, excuse me, Moses writes of Noah, I should say, in this passage of Scripture, and tells us that in verse 5, things were really wicked upon the earth, so wicked that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And verse 11 informs us the earth was corrupt before God. And so what does God want Noah to do? Verse 13, he tells him, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence to them. I'm going to destroy them, he says, with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. And he tells him how many rooms. He tells him how, many, how long. Verse 15, this shall be the length of the ark, 300 cubits. The breadth of it, 50 cubits. The height of it, 30 cubits. He tells him about the window that he is to make for the ark and where it is to be placed and etc., etc. I would like to ask a question here at this point. Is the salvation of Noah an act of the grace of God, yes or no? We know that. Does that therefore rule out any precision obedience expected on man's part? When God told Noah to use gopher wood, what did that precisely mean? It meant to use gopher wood. If God had not cared about the type of wood used, then he would have just told Noah to build the ark out of wood. That's generic authority. But when God gives specific authority and says build it out of gopher wood, that's precise enough. What, did God know that Noah was capable of finding a wood known as gopher wood? Yes. And did God know that Noah could figure out how long 300 cubits was? And 50 cubits and 30? Yes. But was Noah capable of doing what God asked him to do? And was he capable of doing it precisely? Look at verse 22. What does your Bible say? Thus did Noah according to how much? All that God commanded him, so did he. Now, in my judgment for what that's worth, one of the things we need to go back over again and again and again and again with members of the Lord's church, even if they've been members for years, is the common subject and the important subject of how the Bible authorizes because there's so many folks today that don't know how to discuss this matter uh, in ways that really make any sense. 
when God specified what he wanted, did he have to then go down the laundry list of all the other types of wood in the world and say, Thou shalt not use knotty pine. Thou shalt not use this wood. Thou shalt not use this wood. Did he have to give a, a specific, exact laundry list of all the woods he didn't want? Or by specifying gopher wood, what did he automatically rule out? Any wood that wasn't gopher wood was not authorized. And so, why did God choose gopher wood? That's not really the question. The question is, once God has chosen it, what's man's obligation? To do what God said. And to do it in the way God said do it. Did Noah do that? He did. And so precision obedience <coughs> is possible. God never requires of it a man if he's not capable of it. But when he requires it, who are we to come along and say, well, that doesn't really matter. Imagine someone, in fact, if I took some of these articles that I've read from preachers, even in the Lord's church, and I were to transport those personalities back into the days of Noah, I can already see what kind of conversation they'd be having with Noah based on what they've written in their blogs and their articles. Hey, Noah, come here. Let me tell you something. You seem stressed out about following the details that God gave you exactly the way God said to do them. Look, that, that stuff doesn't matter. As long as you are thinking about God when you build this ark, He doesn't care if it's 250 cubits or 350. As long as you're thinking about God when you build this ark, He doesn't care whether it's made out of this wood or that wood or another wood. As long as it's an ark and you build it for God, that's what matters to Him. I can already hear them suggesting to Noah that that would be the case. And I can already hear Noah saying, as long as I'm living and God's word is clear to me, I'm going to do what God says do in the way God says do it, no matter what, come what may. And what an attitude. That's what we need. Not looking for ways to dilute what God said and to minimize it. Let me show you another example of this that's very familiar to us all. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12 for just a moment. We're teaching the book of Exodus in our first quarter here at the school. And Exodus chapter 12 mentions in verse number 3 that actually there was a tenth plague coming. You remember the other plagues had prepared them for this one. And according to verse 3 of Exodus chapter 12, Moses and Aaron were instructed to speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, and watch the specificity of this, in the tenth day of this month. Now what do you think that really meant? That's pretty simple, isn't it? The tenth day of this month. Is that precise? It doesn't say, uh, on a day of your choosing, sometime in a month or two, and the tenth day of this month, every man should take a lamb. Well, is there any precise instruction given concerning the lamb? Look at verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. So God expected them to know whether a lamb was blemished or unblemished. There were ways by which they could know that. And uh, God knew that they could know that they could know that. And so he gave them these specific instructions. It needs to be a male. So one kind of lamb wasn't as good as another. A blemished lamb was not as good as an unblemished one. A female on this occasion would not have been as acceptable as a male. And what age did it need to be? Did God get precise about that? Verse 5. A male of what? The first year. Now... That's very specific. Verse 6 says, you keep it till the 14th day of the same month. So there's no wiggle room here. They don't have the, well, I'm busy. I'll have to probably get to it about the 17th. No. And this other guy that might come along and say, well, you know what? You might wait for the 14th day. But I'm so excited to do this. I'm going to do it on the 12th just to show God how much I love it. If you really want God to know how much you love him, if you love me, keep my commandments. Is the principle Jesus uh, gives us in John 14, and it's certainly true in the Old Testament as well. So, 14th day of this month, same month, and then watch verse 6. It says, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it any specified time in the evening. Now watch verse 7. They shall take the blood, strike it on the two side posts and the upper door posts of the house where they eat this. And he says uh, 
the verse number 13, 12, when I pass through the land of Egypt this night, I'll smite all the firstborn. And then verse 13, the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Hence the term Passover. I won't pass through you. I'll pass over you. Is there a difference between passing through and passing over? If you have a sharp knife in your hand, is there a difference between passing it through your hand and passing it over your hand? Well, obviously. And so here he says, I want you to know that I will pass over you. This was a gift of grace and life. And guess what? It was hinged upon some precision obedience. Uh, I would like to show you the difference between legalism and liberalism and how the truth doesn't have to be either. Liberalism would say, you don't really have to kill a lamb. If you just say the firstborn prayer and ask God to save your firstborn child without doing any of this other stuff, he said, look, prayer is powerful. You just pray to God, you say, God, save my firstborn. I know you're capable of saving my firstborn without me having to smear blood anyway. If I smear the blood, then I've saved my firstborn. God, I want you to save my firstborn. So I'm just going to pray to you and ask you to do it so you'll get all the glory. Would that have worked? Would that have been obedient to God's instructions based on everything that we know? Of course not. Now let me show you the other side of this coin, the legalism, the radicalism that some individuals get into. Not only must you kill a lamb, and not only must you smear its blood on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the house where you eat the Passover, I'll show you exactly the location on the side post and the upper doorpost where you must smear it. Did God give an exact cord, a GPS coordinate where he wanted the blood smeared on the two side posts of the upper door? As long as it's on the side, it's on the door, upper door post, it can be put where? It, it would be authorized to be anywhere as long as it's on those places. And legalism would say, no, you've got to do it exactly where I say to do it or you're not really truly obedient to God. But you do have to do it on the two side posts and the upper door posts. Liberalism would say, smear the blood and smear it any way you want to. As long as you smear the blood, God, God doesn't care whether you put it on the side or the up. Just smear the blood. That's what they would say if they wanted you to smear the blood at all. But the legalism binds where God hasn't found. Liberalism looses where God has not loosed. Well, is there, a, is there an in-between that is true and accurate that we don't have to go to either extreme? Guess what? If you, if you take a male lamb of the first year that is unblemished on the 10th day of this month and you keep it till the 14th day of the same month and you kill it in the evening and then you take the blood and you strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein you eat the Passover, you would be guaranteed that what? <coughs> Your firstborn will not die. Well, were they capable of such precise obedience? The way some of these articles I've read read is as if it's just too hard. Man can't do things. Well, look at Exodus 12 and verse 28. What does your Bible say in Exodus 12 and verse number 28? The children of Israel went away and what? They did, did what? As the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. Have you noticed these two verses side by side? Genesis 6.22, Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so did he. They went and did all that God had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. Is, were they capable of obeying the precise instructions that God had given them, yes or no? And after they did so, could they strut and crow and brag about how they had saved themselves by their own ingenious plan? Did they get in a room somewhere and say, you know what? That flood that's coming, I think what we've got to do is build a boat that will carry us and help us. No, God told them to build the boat. No one to build the boat. What about these folks in Exodus 12? After this all happened and their firstborn survived, could they go around bragging at what they come up with? This would have been from God, but there was precise obedience expected in order to receive that blessing. Let me show you what happens when 
there isn't precise obedience. Look at Leviticus chapter 10. Written for our learning, what is it that we learn? Leviticus chapter 10. Here's Nadab and Abihu. They're sons of Aaron. They're priests. They take either of them the censer. They put fire therein. They put incense thereon. And then offer strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Now fire is fire. As long as it's hot and fiery, it's fire. That, that's all that matters. It doesn't, God doesn't care about little persnickety details like whether it's an exact type of fire or not. That's what some people would want you and me to believe about God. Is he, He's not interested in details at all. He's just interested in general obedience. Those little you know, small minutia matters don't really matter. Well, what does your Bible tell you in Leviticus chapter 10 and verse number 2? When they offered the strange fire before the Lord, which He commanded them not, did God say, well, at least you're offering me something. That's what really matters. It's okay. What does this passage indicate about the character and the nature of God when He has specified what He wants? Are there consequences for rejecting that and going the other direction? Your Bible says there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Some years ago, there was a brother who wrote a book called The Church in Transition. Uh, and he was appearing at uh, Crowley's Ridge College to answer questions about his book. My dad and I were there, among others. And uh, I remember waiting our turn. And when I got a chance to stand up, I'd read his book. And it suggested this. Look, there are matters that matter. But then there are all these peripheral matters that really don't matter. And he said the church today should be focused on, you know, core principles like death, burial, resurrection of Christ. If you've got that down, the other stuff doesn't really add up to much. And whether you take the Lord's Supper on a particular day of the week or with particular elements or etc., it is not a matter that matters. It's not an internal matter. It's an external matter. How we worship God is not really an internal matter as much as it is an external matter. And so when it was my turn to, to speak, I just, in a very respectful way, said, uh, I would like to ask you, if Nadab and Abihu were here tonight, would they say that how we worship God is an internal matter, a matter that matters, or an external matter, a matter that doesn't really matter? Couldn't believe his answer. He said, Nadab and Abihu are dead. <laughs> yes, they are. And why did they die when they died? They died when they died because, because they had disobeyed God, offered him a fire that was not authorized, and that is obvious written for our learning. What do we learn from it? Does worshiping God acceptably matter or not matter? Go back to Genesis 4 with me. Cain and Abel both worship God. There's no question as to where their worship was directed. It was directed to the same person. And you and I are being told, look, in different church buildings, people may differ and worship in different ways. And as long as they're worshiping God, it really doesn't matter how they worship as long as it's God-directed. That's what he really cares about is whether he's being worshipped or not. Well, let's see about that. In Genesis chapter 4, written for our learning, we find that Cain, verse 3, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. What's, your, what's the next phrase in your Bible read? He brought the offering unto the Lord. It was given to whom? To God. And then verse 4, Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. So, true or false, the details must matter to some degree or God would have just said, look, as long as you're giving it to me, that's all that really matters. Did Cain give his offering to God, yes or no? Did God accept it? So something's wrong with it. 
how do you know what was wrong with it? Well, that, here's the basic general way you know. Romans 10, 17 says, By faith comes how? By hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. When God tells us what He wants us to know, it's our obligation to do what He asks us to do. Now go to Hebrews 11. And notice that when the Hebrews writer is talking about this, in verse number 4, he writes this, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Why was his more excellent than was Cain's? Because he offered it how? By faith. And faith comes how? By hearing the word of God. Abel's offering was in accordance with the word of God. Cain's was not. And that is the main issue that needs to be kept before us. So how we worship God is a big deal. And the personnel involved in worship is a precise detail that matters. Let me ask you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel 13. Saul is hitting the panic button. The Philistines are amassing. And this is after, according to 1 Samuel 13, 1, Saul had reigned a year, and then when he reigned two, this happens. He chose him, uh, verse 2, 3,000 men of Israel. And uh, the Bible says that uh, there was an assembly called the Philistines had gathered themselves together to fight with Israel verse 5 30,000 chariots 6,000 horsemen the people of Israel saw there in strait the people were distressed they're hiding in caves and thickets and rocks and high places and pits according to verse 6 and uh, verse number 8 he tarried seven days according to the set time Samuel had appointed but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And so Saul, growing impatient for the priest to arrive, says, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Well, isn't the most important thing here that God be given an offering? Does it really matter as to who gives the offering? Is God even interested in... Uh, persnickety little details as I said earlier about uh, who does what. Does God really care about whether women do things in worship or whether men do things in worship? What, what is the, the point here? And I'll get to your uh, hand there in just a moment. Let me uh, read this real quickly before it escapes my mind. Samuel asked him in verse 11, he said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me and you, you know, you didn't come within the days appointed. If, if you come when you should have, I wouldn't have been put in that position playing the blame game even before you get to chapter 15. Uh, Saul is told by Samuel, you've done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee. And he said, verse 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. You're going to lose your kingdom over this because you have not honored God's law about the offering and who offered it. Yes? We only, got, we only go about three chapters from the beginning of the Bible and we run into Adam and Eve and we all know what happened to them. Uh, God gave them, told them certain things they could and couldn't do. Very precise instructions, right? Yeah. Of every tree in the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree, knowledge of good and evil, thou mayest not eat thereof in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die but what if what if they eat it for God what if they say I'm going to do this for God well, if, you're, if you're going to do something for God then you obey him you do what he asks you to do that's what God wants from us not for us to come up with ways clever ways we think he might be honored but to just do what he asks us to do to honor him and that's so important uh, it does matter. Precise obedience makes a difference, and you see it again and again and again. Now, I want to show you an example here that involves uh, Naaman. Go to 2 Kings chapter 5, if you will. 2 Kings 5. Naaman, let's see if grace and precision obedience can live in the same universe. Can grace and precision obedience live in the same universe? Naaman is the captain, according to verse 1 of 2 Kings 5, is the captain of the host of the king of Syria. 
He's a great man. He's honorable. Uh, but last phrase says what? He was a leper. Verse 2, well, the Syrians have been going out conducting raids. And one of the people they brought back with them was this little girl from Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. She's the attendant to Naaman's wife. And one thing that impresses me about her is stated in verse 3. She said to her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that's in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. She's been taken captive by these folks. And yet, what is she looking for ways to do? Try to bless their lives. Now, what about you? If somebody took you hostage, would you be saying, what can I do to make your life better since you've made mine worse? She has an attitude of, hey, still a human being, and I still want, I still want to make sure that, uh, you know, he can get what he needs as a human being. Now, where could Naaman go on the planet Earth at that time to find a cure for his leprosy that would come from man. There wasn't any way he could be cleansed of his leprosy at that point in time. And so she wants him to go, notice specifics, to the prophet of God in Samaria. The prophet in Samaria. Verse 3. Well, one goes in and tells Naaman what she said. And uh, I'll also point out, by the way, we don't even know her name. Uh, but I will guarantee you, she was a very valuable and important person in Naaman's life, wouldn't you say? Unsung heroes of the Bible, they're all over. And you don't have to be well known to be uh, important to someone's world. And notice she had said something that starts a chain reaction. Well, she had wanted him to go see whom in verse 3? The prophet. And where does he end up going in verse 5? The king of Syria sends him to the king of Israel. The king of Israel reads the letter and he says, what am I, God, that I, can, I can't cleanse a man of his leprosy? Verse 7, he's just picking a quarrel with me. Well, the prophet of God hears about it and says, send him to my house. And then in verse number 9, Naaman came with his horses, his chariot, stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Elisha doesn't even come out. Elisha sent a messenger and said, go Wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Stop. Is there anything precise about that? Tell me what's precise. Number one, the body of water is precise, isn't it? If you wonder whether the precision matters with reference to the body of water, you notice that Naaman wants to substitute water. In fact, he asked in verse 12, are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? And what would some of the anti-precision obedience advocates tell him? Uh, yeah. As long as you dip. In fact, you might not even have to dip. Just say the leper's prayer and ask God to come into your body and eradicate the leprosy, eliminate it. God is so powerful, He can do that just by you saying a prayer. You don't have to get the water. That's liberalism. That's saying that what God said you have to do, you really don't have to do. Legalism would say, well, not only do you have to dip in the Jordan seven times, but you have to dip in this spot of the River Jordan we've selected. As long as He dipped in the River Jordan, it was what? It's okay. That's obedience. They didn't, he didn't have to go to the place these folks had said he had to go to. As long as this River Jordan, it was fine. So any precision about the number of dips? If God didn't care how many times he dipped, then he would have just said, go dip in the River Jordan. You'll be cleansed. But God said what? Dip seven times. He said, dip seven times in the Jordan. What does Naaman do in reaction to this at first? And by the way, let this be a reminder to you and to me. When we're studying the Bible with someone and their initial reaction is anger and they go away in a rage, don't give up. Don't give up immediately. Because Naaman goes away in a rage. It's, this did not meet his preconceived notion of how this would all you know, take place. 
He thought, and that's so much the problem in religion today, I thought, well, if God's will does not match my thinking, then my thoughts will reign supreme. No, God has to reign supreme. I thought, what? What did you think, Naaman? Well, I thought he will surely come out to me. He didn't. I thought he would stand and he would call upon the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place, you know, like the infected areas and recover me of my leprosy that way. And I'm being told instead I've got to dip seven times in the Jordan River, the muddy Jordan. I, I don't think so. And so he turned and he went away in a rage, according to verse 12. I'm so glad the story doesn't end here. What are the names of his servants? I don't know the single name of any of those servants. But I can promise you this. They made a, an impact in his life. His servants came near, verse 13, spake to him, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, <laughs> wouldn't you have done that again? How much rather than when he says, wash and be clean. It's so simple. Why don't you just do it? Whatever they said worked on him. Verse 14, then went he down, dipped himself, how many times? Seven times. Where? In Jordan. Why? According to the saying of the man of God. And what? The flesh came again like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Do you find God's grace and precision obedience merging here in a beautiful, beautiful way? God did for Naaman what only God could have done. There was no one else that could have given Naaman the gift of cleansing that God could give him. You talk about grace. And yet there was a precise means whereby God would effect that grace upon Naaman's leprosy. And that was for him to dip seven times in the Jordan. Uh, liberalism says you don't have to dip at all. Or if you do, you don't have to dip seven times. Or you could dip eight if you want. Or the legalist might come along and say, you might have missed a dip, so you might, you might want to make sure you get one for good measure. And I don't know how they would try to reason this, but I, or you have to dip, you have to say this before each dip, you must say, I call upon thee, God, to cleanse me of my leprosy. And then you dip. And if you don't say that seven times before you dip, you won't be cleansed. That would be legalism. Because why? Also, precision in the action. Yeah, don't sprinkle. Right. Precision even in the action as well. He didn't say reach down and get you seven sprinkles of, of the Jordan and that'll be fine. There's precision in the place. There's precision in the action. There's precision in the number of times the action should be observed. And so that's, who's, who is this we're reading? This is God. Did, did God suddenly change between Malachi and Matthew and suddenly decide, well, you know what? Details don't matter to me anymore. It's no matter anymore. Or did he give us any specificity in our new covenant about how to be saved? Any specificity as to how to be saved? Do we have to dip? Not seven times. Do we have to dip? Not in the River Jordan. Do we have to dip ever? Where? In any place where you can find enough water to immerse? Are there any prerequisites to that dipping? Jesus said he that believeth and is baptized or dipped in water. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And when the eunuch said, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? What was he told? If you believe with all your heart, you may. There's a precision required there. Uh, both he that believeth and is baptized. And we know from other passages in the New Testament, uh, there is a there is a need to do what God says do the way God says do it. Uh, with worship, with the plan of salvation, with the pattern of the church organization. These principles carry over. I, I, before the time gets completely away, I want to deal with what is their sugar stick passage, if you will, for why they think we have... They say everyone wants to go to Nadab and Abihu, and they never want to spend any time at all in 2 Chronicles to talk about Hezekiah's Passover. And so, uh, why don't you go to 2 Chronicles 30 and see if precision obedience is really required or not. Alright, let's do that as we come down the final few minutes of, of the class.
In 2 Chronicles 30, we have King Hezekiah, and uh, he has sent a, a letter out to all of Israel and Judah, inviting them to come and keep, verse 1, keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. The king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. Now that's important to note because the original ideal time, the, the time that was required by God in the first place to keep this Passover was actually in what month? The first month. But let me show you some legislation from Numbers chapter 9 that shows you that the second month was authorized for certain people at certain times. In Numbers chapter 9, you'll note that what does God tell them? In verse 1, we're told, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness in Sinai. In what month is it? According to Numbers 9, 1. First month of the second year. And then he says in verse 3, in the 14th day of this month, that would be what month? First month. At even, you shall keep it in his appointed season. According to all the rites of it, according to all the ceremonies thereof, shall you keep it. Does that sound like precision obedience was expected? Well, yes. And Moses spoke to the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept it on the 14th day of the first month at even in the wilderness. According to, why did they do it so precisely on that day at that time? According to all the Lord had commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. Ah, oh, but there were certain men, verse 6, who were defiled by a dead body of a man. And the law said he couldn't keep the Passover in that defiled state. So they came to Moses and Aaron and said, look, we're defiled, verse 7, by the dead body of a man. Why are we kept back that we may not offer an offering to the Lord in his appointed season? And Moses says to them, stand still. I love his attitude. I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. Moses doesn't say, well, the way I see it. Or my personal view of this is, his view is, well, what is God going to reveal about this? That's what will guide me and govern you. And so he says, let me talk to God or find out what God wants. The Lord speaks to Moses in verse 9. And he tells him in verse 10, Now, if any man of you or your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or if you're in a journey afar off, you will keep the Passover still. You're still obligated to keep it, but watch. Verse 11, the 14th day of the second month, and even they shall keep it. And eat unleavened bread, bit the same things that they would do in the first months, just a different time. They're regulated by the same requirements except for the time. Now, he said, now this is not just so you can go out on a trip and ignore your responsibilities. He said, verse 13, if you're clean and you're not on a journey and you just say, well, I'll just catch it next month. God says, no, that soul will be cut off from among his people. It was something that they were required to do. Now, go back to 2 Chronicles 30 and notice that Hezekiah has taken counsel to keep it in the second month. And verse 3 tells you why. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And so they're going to do it in uh, the second month on the 14th day. And so you'll notice he tells them in verse 8, don't be stiff-necked like your fathers were. You need to yield and you need to turn again to the Lord, verse 9. And so these letters go out from city to city in verse 10. And some of the people scorn and laugh. Verse 10, mock. Others say, we're coming to Jerusalem. We're going to attend this feast. And uh, notice verse 13. There assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread. In the second month, a very great congregation. They were not sufficiently purified to do it in the first. They arose and took away the altars in Jerusalem and all the altars for incense that had been there. Got rid of those idolatrous altars and replaced them with altars for the Lord in verse 15. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month. And they were ashamed that they had to do it that month because if they'd been more diligent and on time to get ready to do it, they should have done it when? They knew it. And the first month. 
And so the Bible says that they killed the Passover. The priests and the Levites were ashamed, sanctified themselves, brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord, stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. It sounds like they're trying to follow the details. The priests sprinkled the blood. Now watch verse 17. There were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore, the Le Levites had the charge of killing the Passover for everyone that was not clean. And then verse 18 is what the anti-precision obedience folks think is their ticket out of precise obedience. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. See? God didn't strike them, did he? They did otherwise than it was written. And God didn't strike them dead. And so if someone does otherwise than it's written today in the New Testament, it's not a big deal. It's not something to get all up in arms about. God doesn't care about the details. Why are you showing me Nadab and Abihu? And after that, you see here, God says, but you know what? These folks stop reading too soon. So many false teachers stop reading before the very thing that would take their false doctrine and, and take it away. It's true that some folks ate this Passover in an unclean position. That's true. And it's true they didn't die right there on the spot. That's true. But Hezekiah prayed for them saying, the good Lord, what? Pardon. What does pardon imply? Hezekiah praying that the Lord would pardon them implies what? They had done something sinful for which they needed pardon. And Hezekiah prays for them to receive this pardon. But notice the condition. Hezekiah prayed for them saying, The Lord, Lord, good Lord, rather pardon everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah. And notice and healed the people. And so the idea that this is your passage to show that God doesn't really require you to keep the, you know, the details because they didn't and they got by with it is ignoring the fact that they needed what? Forgiveness. They needed pardon. And God is gracious. Now, can, someone says, why did God strike Nadab and Abihu dead but not them? Well, why did God strike Ananias and Sapphira dead for lying, but not every liar that ever told a lie? God knows, and I would never question his wisdom, but I want to ask you a question. Should I deduce the following? Does the following logical? Is the following logical? Because God did not strike every liar dead immediately like he did Ananias and Sapphira, therefore lying is not really all that big of a deal. Does that work? That doesn't work at all, does it? A sovereign God knows what he's doing. And whenever he has executed someone for something in the Old or New Testaments, I can promise you it was deserved. God would never do a hair trigger and did send a message. I guarantee you others found out, whoa, I better be careful with what I say. Or in the Old Testament, I better be careful with how I do what God wants me to do. Now, can I say this in closing? This... Do you not need the grace of God? Well, yes. And guess what? If I've done everything I've been commanded to do in the way God told me to do it, can I walk up to Him on the day of judgment and say, give me what I deserve, God. I deserve heaven. No, I still deserve to go to hell. But what I am granted is the opportunity to go to heaven by His grace and mercy. Does he have the right to say, I'll give you my grace and mercy if? Does he have the right to say that? And once he's designated what the if is for you and me in our covenant, then are we duty bound to do what God said do in the way God said do it to receive his blessings? Sure. Any closing comment or question from you?
Right, well, on this occasion, uh, I should probably clarify and make sure that I made this clear. The law of Moses had said it was all right to do it in the second month, on the 14th day, as long as you were cleansed. Um, but, um, so they had to change that. What happened is some who were not cleansed still tried to take it then. That was wrong. Hezekiah prayed for them to be part of it. Okay, I guess our time's up. Sorry about that. Thank you.